We're going to look at Revelation chapter 4 today. We did the first part of uh, Revelation chapter 4 last week because I said that there was two aspects to understanding Revelations 4 and 5, which is a grouping, a section all in its own. The primary aspect of chapters 4 and 5 is the worship of the one that's on the throne. God is seated on the throne in chapter 4. Jesus Christ is seated next to him in chapter 5. So in chapter 4, we see God being worshipped, and we want to look at the phrases that are being said to God so that we can understand what is the nature of that worship. And then in chapter 5, we'll do the same thing with Jesus. Last week, I covered all the cultic symbols. I call the cultic symbols... Um, the things that stick out like four creatures and seven heads and uh, 24 elders and uh, the rainbows, the stuff that makes everybody curious. It's important that we understand that that stuff is secondary. So I covered it last week briefly, uh, the secondary aspects. We're going to cover the primary aspect of chapter four today, and that is what does it look like when the elders and the authorities in heaven are worshiping the one who's on the throne? So let's read chapter 4 again, and this week I'm just going to focus as we finish on verses 8 through 11. Verses 8 through 11, but I want to read you the whole chapter. So here we go, Revelation 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door stood open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I'll show you what, may take, what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, in, and with one seated on the throne. If you write in your Bibles, I would circle verse 2, because that is the focal main point of chapters 4 and 5. There is one seated on the throne in heaven. Verse 3, And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of of emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with gold crowns on their head. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass that was made like crystal. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures. They're full of eyes in front and behind, and the first living creature was like, a, was like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature the face of a man, the fourth living creature was like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes all around within, day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. That's going to be the focus of our sermon today. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's two songs in chapter 4. And there's going to be three songs in chapter 5. This is the first song, song number 1. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and forever, the 24 elders, now we're switching, the praise is switching from the four cherubim, the four creatures, and now the, 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 the praise is including the 24 elders that we studied about last week. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. And here we have song number two. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So verse 2 the one seated on the throne, and then verses 8 through 11, the two songs of worship that we see sung. Those are what we're going to focus on today. Uh, you can't help but notice that there was tons of Old Testament allusions in the section that we just read. Uh, the, the cherubim with the six wings, we saw that in Isaiah chapter 6 in his throne room scene. 
uh, the myriad of eyes and the, the ox and the eagle and the human face, all of that was described in Ezekiel chapter 1 when Ezekiel had his throne room vision while he was in exile. Uh, the brilliance of God, God's majesty being uh, compared to uh, light reflecting through precious gems, precious jewels and a rainbow the rainbow brings to mind the pact that God made with Noah that he would never again destroy the world by flood. Um, and then the cherubim, the four creatures are interpreted as the heavenly cherubim. You know, these cherubim play a huge part in heaven somehow, a bit of a mystery to us. But there's something important. When God had Solomon build his temple for him, do you remember he gave him special directions? And he said, you need to follow the instructions of the building of the temple exactly the way that I've given them to you because this is an earthly representation of what things are like in heaven. And as a reminder, one of the things that he was told to do was to paint cherubims all over the walls of the holy temple. Cherubims were to be painted on the walls. Uh, if you remember, there were two cherubims that were touching wings over the Ark of the Covenant. And if you remember, the veil that divided the holy room from the holy of holies, the veil that tore in half when Jesus was crucified, that veil had two cherubims embroidered onto it. So cherubims play a significant part in heaven and they were a significant part of Solomon's temple. So all of these allusions, but like I said, those are all secondary. What we want to focus on today is the one seated on the throne and the nature of how he is being worshipped in heaven. Because if we remember Jesus' prayer, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to see how worship is done in heaven. Uh, let's start with verse 8, and we'll work our way through the text here. Verse 8, the four living creatures, these are what we're calling the cherubims. Each of them had six wings full of eyes all around, within day and night. They never ceased to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I want to look at this word, hagios. Hagios is the word that's been translated holy, but you know, really, I have difficulty with the word holy, and maybe it was because of my upbringing. Those of you who don't know, I was raised Catholic. And for the longest time, the idea of something being holy had to do with the way something appeared, the way something looked. For instance, when I used to walk into the cathedral, the Catholic church, with the high ceilings and the awesome, massive architecture, the statues that were in there, the... <laughs> The stained glass that was in the background. I remember walking in thinking, this is holy. This room is holy. Holiness had to do with like the way things looked, the way things appeared. I remember seeing the nuns in the hallways. They looked holy. Why? Because they dressed in these unique outfits and they were pious. And the way they walked almost seemed holy. And holding the rosary in their hands, it just looked holy. Holy, And I need to say that that's the complete wrong definition of what hagios means. Hagios specifically means other. And even when I found that out, that's still rather ambiguous, other. Really a much better, it, 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 it's painting, when, when we talk about God's holiness, hagios means other, um, different than, separate from. Uh, really, my favorite way to express holy would be unlike. When we say God is holy, hagias, hagias, hagias. There's a special term for that. It's called the trisagion. Trisagion, that's an important phrase. Those three hagias is strung together. And what it's saying is God is unlike anything you've ever seen, anything you can imagine, and most of all, unlike his creation unlike us. That's the idea of hagias. God is unlike. And I would prefer that word to holy because for many of us, the word holy means something else. There's holy water, people think. 
There are uh, holy prayers. I think these are the wrong ideas, but unlike us, unlike the creation, the creator, the potter, is unlike the clay. That's the idea of hagias. The architect is unlike the building, right? The engineer is unlike the dam that he engineered. <clears throat> the uh, musician, the, uh, the music maker is unlike the fiddle that he made. That's the idea of hagias, unlike. Uh, I'm afraid that one of the, uh, the biggest weaknesses in the church nowadays is that most churches are making a God that looks just like us, a God that is just like us, likes what we like, enjoys what we enjoy, and that's absolutely not the picture. Hagias means that he is unlike his creatures. Uh, let's look at a couple verses here. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. <clears throat> Hannah, uh, in 1 Samuel, the first three chapters of the book of 1 Samuel deal with Hannah and uh Hannah was a woman that was barren. She could not bear children, and this caused her much grief. And so Hannah prayed to God that he would work in her life to provide her with a child. And so this idea of holiness that we're going to see from Hannah's perspective is God is someone who can do what no one else can do. His power is a power like no one else has. His deeds are like deeds that no one else can replicate. And so Hannah, when she is given a child by God, God does the impossible in her life. Hannah calls God holy because he is unlike. Who can do that? Who can give you a child when you can't have one on your own? Only God can do that. And so it's interesting if we pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, and you should read that as we study this idea of holiness on your own time. 1 Samuel chapter 2 is Hannah's, pray, uh, Hannah's song of praise to God. Hannah is singing a song of praise to God the same way the, the four cherubim are here. And she exalts God for all the things that he can do that no one else can do. That's what makes him holy, unlike anyone else. Uh, Picking up in verse 2, she specifically says, There is none, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, There is none holy like the Lord. No one is like God. God is unlike anything. What can you compare God to? God was able to provide Hannah with a baby when it was impossible for her to have one. And she says, who can do that? That is the idea of hagias. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. She goes on uh, describing more attributes of God. The Lord, uh, the Lord kills and the Lord gives life. The Lord brings down to Sheol and the Lord raises up. The Lord makes poor and the Lord makes rich. He brings low and He exalts. God is the one that determines all of these things and that's the nature of hagias. No one else can do that. Nothing else can match that. And so God is hagias. God is unlike anything that we know. Moses gives us an idea of God's holiness. I want to tell you where we're picking up. We're going to read uh, Exodus chapter 15. But I'm going to set up the background. The book of Exodus has two parts to it. Part one of Exodus is the Exodus out of Egypt. Part two is the covenant at Mount Sinai. In part one, the exodus out of Egypt, there is another section within there, chapters five through 15. Chapters five through 15 is where God introduces himself to Pharaoh. And before long, Pharaoh is also going to say, God is Hagias, who is like the God of Israel. But after all the miraculous things that God did through the plagues and Pharaoh... Um, Finally, the people kicking Israel out of Egypt because your God is so powerful, so hagias, so unlike anything we've ever seen. 
we want you out of here. And as a matter of fact, we're willing to give you gold if you'd be willing to leave. Not only then, but then when Pharaoh changes his mind and chases Israel, Israel crosses the, the Red Sea or the Dead Sea? The Red Sea. There we go. But they cross on dry ground with tall walls of water on both sides. When Pharaoh and Egypt decide to chase them down, the waters come crashing down and kill all of Pharaoh's army. And that's where we're going to pick up. The end of chapter 14 touches about the scene that I just explained to you. And this leaves Israel in awe. The end of chapter 14, we pick it up in verse 30. The Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord God used against the Egyptians. And so the people feared the Lord. That's Hagias. Something that nobody else can do. They believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So they've just witnessed this miraculous event. And Moses does the same thing that Hannah did when she witnessed a miraculous event. Moses breaks out in the worship and song to God. So we pick up in chapter 15 where we have Moses' song recorded for us. And look at how Moses' song begins. Exodus 15 and verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, amongst the gods? Who is like you, majestic in Hagias? Holiness. There's no one like you. You are unlike anything we have ever known. You are awesome in your glorious deeds, awesome in your wonders. We see another example from the psalmist. <clears throat> Did I give that to you? Yeah, Psalms 111. Psalms 111 falls in the, the, the Psalms have been written over a thousand year period of time. Did you know that? The Psalms are co a collection of Psalms from over a thousand year period of time. And uh, they're broken up into five different books just because it's so long. And so the fifth book of the psalm covers verse chapters uh, 107 all the way through the end, 150. These particular psalms happen to do with praises to God for his bringing them out of exile. So we're talking about praises to God in this book number five of praises of God, God's divine intervention into historic events, God's wonderful deeds, God's faithfulness, God's justice, God's mighty acts that have been displayed. And here is a psalm of praise to the Lord, Psalm 111. And we're going to read about the first nine verses. We're looking for the holiness and the awesomeness. Again, in this study of the holiness of God, uh, 2 Samuel, we should read um, Hannah's song, we should read uh, Exodus 15 there, Moses' song, and here Psalms 111. We should read this because all of these talk about how God is unlike anything else. Psalm 111, praise the Lord. I'll give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in him. Full of splendor and majesty are his works. I'm going to skip down to verse 4. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is merciful, provides food for those who fear him. And down to verse six, he has shown his people the power of his works. That's another thing that makes God hagias, holy, unique, unlike anyone else is his power. In giving the inheritance to the nations, the works of his hands are faithful and just. His precepts are trustworthy they are established forever. Verse 9. He sends redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. And here's our word, Hagias. Holy and awesome is his name. Holy and awesome. Because no one, God's power is unlike anyone's power. No one is like God. So this idea of holiness refers us to God's attributes. His goodness is unlike anyone else's goodness. We can't imagine God's goodness. His love is unlike anyone else's love. His power is unlike anyone else's power. And so each of these attributes of God that we might share, right? We have the capacity to love. We have the capacity to be merciful. But are we as merciful as God is? 
No, he is unlike us in that way. Are we as loving as God is? No, and so that's what sets God apart as holy and unlike is because we can't fathom the degree of his love and holiness and mercy and patience. At the same time, we can't fathom the degree of his power and his anger. The Old Testament shows us the nature of God's anger, and that is also a holy attribute of God. It's unlike anything we've ever seen before. If we run over quickly, uh, Ananias and Sapphira in Acts are struck dead because they lied to the apostles. Uzzah is struck dead for touching the ark, if you can remember that. Nadab and Abihu are struck dead because they offered a strange fire, a fire that was unauthorized. A plague killed 24,000 people in the wilderness because of sexual immorality. Scorpions and snakes came into the Israelite camp and killed the Israelites because they complained about the food that God was giving them. Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons in Samuel, are killed because they're fornicating with the people that they're supposed to be being priests to. And so God has a holy anger, which means an anger unlike anything we've ever seen. I want to take you to one verse particularly on this. We're going to look at 1 Samuel. Incidentally, we're going to study 1 Samuel uh, Wednesday night as well, so we're getting a double dose. In uh, the first section of 1 Samuel, the first eight verses, we talked about Hannah is chapters 1 through 3. Chapters 4 through 7 talk about a war that Israel is going to go fight against the Philistines. Now, Israel is a little bit full of themselves. God is not happy with Israel at this point. And so Israel decides they're going to take the Ark of the Covenant and they're going to march that Ark of the Covenant out in front of them. And they're going to go in and they're going to defeat the Philistines. But they don't bother to ask God if this is his will or not. And so God is against them. The Philistines overtake Israel and the Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant they take it back to their place and they put it in their temple to their god, Dagon. Do we remember that story? Anybody? Okay. So what happens to the Philistines? They're overjoyed that they have this Ark of the Covenant, are they? No. They regret taking the Ark of the Covenant because God strikes them with mice and tumors. Okay, mice and tumors. And so what do they do? Well, the priests say, make these golden tumors and these golden mice, put them in the Ark of the Covenant, send that thing back to the Israelites. Get it out of here because God's wrath is too great for us. So they get it out. They send it back. Israel, they're, Israel, uh, they're in a place called Beth, Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh. Here come these two cows walking on their own, which is pretty strange. They walk right into Beth Shemesh, and Israel rejoices, and they're excited because the Ark of the Covenant has come back into Israel. But they don't stay happy for very long. God strikes 70 of these Israelites dead on the spot. And that's where we pick up. We're going to read this account. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5. This is the advice that the priests gave the Philistines, okay? So you must take the images of your tumors and the images of your mice that ravage the land and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from off of you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? We know what happened to Egypt. Don't let it happen to you. <clears throat> so the Egyptians, uh, and they dealt severely with them. So the ark was returned to Beth Shemesh where the Israelites were. And now we pick up the rest of the story. 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 19. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh dead because they looked at the ark of the Lord. So he struck 70 of them. The people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the people of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord? Here we are rejoicing that the Ark of the Covenant has come back to Israel. And the first thing that happens when we stare at the Ark is 70 of us are struck dead. 
That's a holy anger. What is holy? Unlike anything we've ever known. Unlike anything we've ever seen. <clears throat> and so they call God, look at the verse here. Who is able to stand before the Lord? This Hagias God. This holy God. Unlike anything we've ever known. And to whom shall he go away from us? Where will he go to get away from us? So it's strange. If this sounds strange to you, you need to understand that in Numbers chapter 4, in Numbers chapter 4, when God had been talking to Israel, giving them his rules, they were making the tabernacle. And this tabernacle re represented something that was holy. And so God had all kinds of rules about who could go into the tabernacle. Remember, only the priests are allowed to go into the tabernacle. Then there was the curtain. Then there was the Holy of Holies. Who can go into the Holy of Holies? Only the high priest and only once a year. So God had all kinds of rules. If you remember, the furniture that was in the tabernacle was considered holy furniture. You were not allowed to use it for bad purposes. And when it came to the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was holy and it was to stay covered so that you would not stare at it. If you want to read that story, Numbers chapter 4, verses 15 and verse 20. Verses 15 and 20, he says, Do not touch the Ark or you will die. We already remember that rule, right? That's why Uzzah died. But in verse 20, he says, Do not even look at the Ark or you will die. We got to scratch our heads and go, why? What's the big deal? The big deal is the word holy. Holy, we can't fathom it. It is different. God is different than us. God is unlike us. And when God says a rule, he enforces his rule, even if that means the death of his own people. Let's see if, how, 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 likely, how alike we are. How many times have you ever said, if you don't eat everything on your plate, you don't get any dessert. Okay? How many times have you ever given somebody the dessert even though they didn't eat everything on their plate? <laughs> That's the idea of holy. He's unlike. We give in. We cave in. We, we wash over stuff. We overlook Okay, that's the idea of holiness. And even if that's the only thing we get out of this message today, I would say that that's an important aspect. The cherubim, some of the most powerful entities in heaven, are telling us God is holy. He's unlike anything else. So we should worship him, bow before him, and be obedient to him. As we go on in uh, that verse there, who was and is and is to come, I won't spend a lot of time on this aspect of this verse because this is the same verse that we saw in chapter 1 and verse 4. Chapter 1 and verse 4, who was, is, and is to come. This, uh, one of the um, commentators, uh, Daniel Wallace, premier Greek authority today, Dan Wallace, um, Farrar, I believe it's Austin Farrar, uh, a couple other guys are saying that this is the most tortured piece of Greek in the whole book of Revelation. There's all kinds of problems with the grammar and the syntax of this Greek who was, is, and is to come. And it's for a specific purpose, they said. The specific purpose... Oh, and I, I didn't give you the reference. It's in Exodus. Uh, it's when, when God sends Moses to go speak to Israel. And uh, Exodus 13? Ugh. And Moses says, well, if they ask me, what's God's name? What am I supposed to tell them? And he says, tell them, I am the I am. Okay. The reason that this is difficult to translate is because in the Hebrew, I am to be, there is no past tense, present tense, and future tense in the Hebrew. Strange language. I, I don't get it. I'm, I don't know anything about it. But one thing that I know is there's no past tense, present tense, and future tense in the verb I am, to be. There's no such thing as I was. There's no such thing as I will be or I am. There's only this idea of I am that is all existing. No past, present, or future. So when you go to translate that into English or Greek, 
We have to use past tense and present tense and future tense. That's the only way we can express it. But in the Hebrew, it's one word that doesn't have a past, a present, or a future. So what that means is this phrase is always existent. No beginning, no end. When the cherubim are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, is, and is to come, unfortunately that leads us astray. What they're trying to say there is his all everlasting existence. He's always been, always has been, always will be, never had a beginning, and never had an end. You know, I'm careful to critique other uh, sources and churches from the pulpit, but I think this one is important. When the text here is specifically saying, he never had a beginning, never had an end. God was everlasting. I have to admit to you that Joseph Smith disagrees with that. If you want to read this, you ought to look up on the internet the King Follett Discourse. The King Follett Discourse. King as in a king. Follett as in the guy's name. Discourse as in this sermon that Joseph Smith gives. Now keep in mind our text is specifically saying God is everlasting. No beginning, no end has always existed. Joseph Smith begins that discourse by saying, you have heard that God is the God of, oh, how does he word it? That God is the everlasting God. You have heard that. But I will, oh, why am I forgetting all this? I will refute that idea. I will refute that idea, is what Joseph Smith. You have heard that God is the God of the everlasting God. And Joseph Smith says, I will refute that idea. And what he goes on to say in the King Follett discourse is that God was once a man just like you. And then he became a God just like you will. Now that's a big enough issue to bring about that the Christian faith is based on the idea that God has no beginning and no end. God is everlasting. And Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Mormon church, says, I will refute that idea and say God was just like you. God was a man who was born, and then he became God. That should cause us concern if we have Mormon friends or Mormons that we love. That should be a huge concern because they don't worship the same God as the God of the Bible. Moving on in verse 11, worthy are you. This is now the second discourse of praise and songs. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. Uh, it helps to know a little Roman background. This, this phrase, worthy are you, Yeah, worthy are you, verse 11. These three epithets, I assume that's the way you, epithets, epi, yeah, epithets. This is normally the type of grandiosity and praise that would uh, a Roman emperor coming into his city victorious, a triumphant emperor entering his city, the people would line the streets and they would say, worthy are you, Lord and God, these were phrases that the Roman people were using for the Roman emperors. And so these are being shown in heaven to say, it's our heavenly God is the one that is worthy. Heavenly God is the one that is worthy. You know, it was a surprise to me that, uh, for instance, the phrase king of kings, I always thought that that phrase was specifically a title for Jesus. Jesus is the king of kings. But later on, as I started studying some other Greek materials, in particular Homer and the Odyssey, the Bible uses epithets that were already existent in those days. But they reapply the epithets, for instance, that were given to the emperor of Rome. They reapply those same epithets to the God of heaven because they were the biggest, most grandiose phrases they had at that time. The idea of the king of kings is the idea that there are lots of kings, but the noblest one, the, the most powerful one, the most awesome one is the king of all the kings. And I first saw that used in Homer's Odyssey. Has anybody heard of the Odyssey? In the Odyssey, there's a man named Odysseus. Odysseus is the main character. He has to leave his wife Penelope 
to go fight in the Trojan Wars. And when he comes back to his own home country, he's introduced as Odysseus, the king of kings. And when I saw that, I said, wait a second, that's Jesus' title. They can't say that. But Odysseus, uh, the Odyssey was written 700 years before Christ. 700 years before Christ. So what that tells us is that even the Bible uses common epithets of the day and reapplies them to God and to Jesus as supreme beings. When it says, worthy are you, I almost don't like that because it sounds like the creation is saying, okay, God, you're worthy. But that's not exactly what it means. In this quote by Crodel, the acclamation, worthy are thou, expresses a value judgment that includes the consensus of those that are governed, the governed subjects regarding the moral excellence of the ruler. What this is doing is this is doing something similar to what Rahab did when Rahab was in Jericho. Do you remember that the Israelites were supposed to go in and kill everyone in Jericho? And when the walls fall down, Rahab said, I've heard of your God. I've heard of the God of Israel. I've heard about what he did in Egypt and how the plagues that he brought on Pharaoh. I've heard how he brought you out of Egypt and parted the Red Sea. I've heard of your God, and I will serve the God of Israel. That's in essence saying he is worthy. I've heard about him, I've read about him, and he is the true God. He is the true one worthy of worship. And so that's the idea of them saying you are worthy. Lord and God was an epithet that they would give to the emperors and the kings, after they died. Once a Roman emperor died, they did what they called deified the emperor. They deified him. They made him a god. Understand, this was back in the Roman days, mythology, when everything could be a god, right? The god of rain, the god of fire. They had all these obsessions with gods. But the emperor that died would become a god. Do you know, um, by the time of uh, John's writing here in Revelation, after the death of Domitian, Domitian was the first emperor that demanded that people call him <clears throat> Kurios Hotheos, Kurios Hotheos, Lord and God. Domitian demanded that people call him that before he died. If you remember, it was, uh, was it uh, Thomas, Doubting Thomas, that when he touched Jesus, he bowed before him and said, Kurios Hotheos, my Lord and my God. And so this epithet that was normally given to the emperors of Rome is being ascribed only to God in heaven. The second part of this, you created all things and by your will they exist and they are created. This was fighting a, a heresy of dualism. In those days, the Greeks thought that the gods were completely removed and separate from people on earth. The gods had their own place, and they were completely uh, unconcerned with the earth, completely detached from anything happening on the earth. And so here specifically, he's saying, no, the God, the holy God, the only God, is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and so as the creator, he interacts with his people and he uh, has expectations of his people. <clears throat> it was antithetical to the Greek worldview at the time. Robert Mounts in his commentary said, this section is a de direct refutation of the dualistic idea that God as a spirit would not be involved with a material creation. That was what they were thinking. If you remember... In uh, 1 John, the whole purpose of John's epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the whole purpose of the, John's epistles was to fight this idea that you are spirit and therefore have nothing to do with the earth, or you are earthly and you have nothing to do with the spirit. To explain how that would cause problems, when it comes to Jesus, what do we believe about Jesus? 
Jesus was God in the flesh. And the Greeks couldn't handle that idea of God in the flesh. And so they were saying that there's only one of two options. If Jesus was God, then he wasn't in the flesh. He was just some kind of a ghost that we saw. And the other option is if Jesus was in the flesh, then he couldn't be God because God would never become flesh. And so there was this dualistic problem with the Greeks, and yet the text tells us that Jesus was God and was flesh. And so John had to write his epistles, and he called this person the Antichrist, the person who denies that Jesus came in the flesh is the Antichrist. That's this Greek dualism that he's talking about. These Greeks that say Jesus couldn't have been God, or if he was God, then he wasn't flesh. And John's epistles were written to counteract that. <clears throat> and so here he's specifically saying God is involved in the creation in the material world. God is the potter, and the potter does what he likes with his clay. God is the creator of all things. Without him, nothing exists that has been brought into existence. I already mentioned Joseph Smith. May as well mention one more time. Here the scripture is saying plainly that God is the creator of everything. And in Colossians, we'll read everything visible and invisible was created by him. Joseph Smith preached something different. He said only matter is eternal. Matter existed forever and ever and ever. God was born. Because God was born and later became God, God did not create everything. God organized everything. God took stuff that was already here and he organized it. That's what Joseph Smith taught. Directly against the text that we're looking at, God is the creator of everything. Everything visible, everything invisible, nothing that is happened without God creating it. Those are important, important texts to bring out for people that we love that have been lied to and misled. They're being taught a God that is different than the God of the Bible. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. We as his creatures, as his worshipers, should always keep that in mind. God is not like us. God is holy. He is different. Who can be compared to him? His goodness, his mercy, his wrath, his anger, his justice, his discipline, his love. All of those are holy. Holy. That is the end of chapter 4. I think we're going to stop there. The end of chapter 4. Two songs are sung. There's going to be three more songs that are going to be sung. And the importance of these verses is the most powerful and elevated creatures in the heavens are worshiping God in this way. Talking about His holiness, His uniqueness, His unlike anything else. And because of that, the elders that are up there bow down at His feet and throw their crowns at His feet because God is the omnipotent one. God is the sovereign one. And He should be acknowledged as that. The creator of all things. All things were created by Him and all things exist to please Him and that puts the church in its proper place. The church in its proper place to exalt God in worship. And our sole purpose is to please Him. To please the Creator. When the potter makes a vessel that is designed to be drank liquid out of. When the potter makes a cup, the purpose of that cup is so that you can drink liquid out of it. If the cup develops cracks and leaks all the liquid out, it's not serving the purpose for which it was designed. And so proper worship of God, one aspect of that is to please God with our actions. 
He also said, because I am holy, I want you to be holy as well. Be holy because I am holy. Be unlike anything else. Be unlike your community. Be unlike your surroundings because I am unlike your surroundings. Be holy because I am holy. We're going to stop there and we will pick up uh, Revelation chapter 5 next week. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we have seen what the worship is like in heaven. That the most powerful, authoritative figures in heaven all bow down, calling you worthy just as Rahab did. I've heard of the God of the Israelites. I've heard what he's done in the world. And that's the God that I'm going to worship because he is holy. He is unlike anything else in the world. As the creator of the world, Father, we revere you, we exalt you, the creator of all things. And Father, we realize that we are only here to please you. And we want to be able to lift up our praise and our worship of you, Father, the same way that it is being done in heaven with all reverence and humility, bowing down before your throne, casting crowns, acknowledging that you are all sovereign, all powerful, everything unlike us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.